Hello and welcome uh, to this special uh, Game Republic event, XR VR. Um, hope you're well. I hope you've all got your Xbox, PS5, Oculus Quest 2 pre-orders in. Um, we've got some great guests uh, lined up uh, today. Uh, we have um, Cooperative Innovations, which is fantastic. We have End Dreams joining us. We have uh, Realized Realities, and uh, we've got XR Stories joining us as well. So um, really great uh, lineup of, of guests. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you'll see Jed there on the screen. If you've got any questions for Jed or any of our speakers, then um, please just pop them into the Q&A bit at the bottom. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll crack on and over to you, Jed. Just to mute yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one moment. Okay, hopefully, hopefully everybody can see that. Okay. So this is just um, a quick run over the current look of the VR market from our perspective. We're a specialist XR consultancy called Realize Realities based in Manchester. There we go, I've got control. Um, so my name is Jed Ashforth. Uh, as Jamie said, I'm an immersive user experience specialist and one of the co-founders of Realized Realities. In a past life, uh, myself and my business partner came from a Sony PlayStation VR background. Uh, we were two of the guys that uh, created and built that. So, <clears throat> we, uh, as a business, we keep a look over the, uh, over the wider XR landscape uh, and kind of observe all the goings on and stuff like this. So, while some of this is very relevant for games, and this will hopefully give you a little bit of perspective of where that sits in, in the larger scheme of things. So, overall, XR is looking very healthy. Uh, it's very well positioned for a socially distanced future. We can all see the potential benefits. Um, and there's lots of stuff that's going to work straight off the bat. Um, you know, once people uh, start using it for those reasons. Um, the XR industry has been impacted in lots of ways by COVID. But to be honest with you, as I've said, we've not been impacted in uh, as, as many ways as other sectors. And so we're actually in a very good position moving forward as long as we can kind of, you know, survive the storm, as it were. Um, so of the three XR technologies, VR continues to snowball in popularity. It's a slow snowballing, like all, you know, snowballing effects are. Um, it's picking up. When we look at some of the numbers in a, in a minute, you'll see that it's actually doing very, very well. Um, one of the problems we've got there is that the user base isn't growing as fast as the tech is advancing. So, you know, somebody buys a headset and two years later, it really is kind of out of date. Um, so that's one of the challenges that they're facing at the moment. But that's just a natural part of any mature in the marketplace. AR, it's been around for a long time. It'll still be around for a long time, yeah. Um, it's very, very popular, highly used, but for very specific apps and very specific purposes. Um, and really, it's looking for wearables to come along. It's looking at uh, some change on the interface to really kind of come into its own and, and blow out wider than just sort of being used for social chat apps and things like that. Um, and mixed reality, unfortunately, is still probably two or three years away. Now, we'll take a little look at all of them. So I know everybody likes charts and stats. Charts and stats, yeah, it's fantastic. I get excited. I don't know, I hate them. Um, but it's useful to uh, I'll look at some of them just to give a bit, a little bit of context. So looking at COVID, there has been a slight um, contraction. We'll look at it in a little bit. But it's, it's a few, it's 7 billion. 7 billion is a lot. Uh, sorry, 0.7 billion, but it's, while it's a lot, um, in the grand scheme of things, come looking at the trajectory of the businesses uh, in the XR sector, it's a hiccup. It's seen as uh, just kind of not having been affected by COVID nearly as much as some of the other sectors have. We've got 175 million VR users worldwide as of June, which is a really good number. Um, and the multi-connected headsets on Steam have been growing over the years. You can see on the chart on the right there, that blue exponential trend line um, is ticking up. And you can see a big jump there where Half-Life Alex came out. It actually doubled the number of installed users on Steam within a single quarter, which is fantastic. When we look at the headset market share on Steam, you can see from this that Facebook is absolutely killing it. They've got the lion's share of the uh, market on Steam as well as on their own platform. Um, but um, this doesn't include PlayStation VR because PlayStation VR is obviously not on Steam. Uh, and so when I tell you how well PlayStation VR is doing in a minute, that's another uh, I am. So anecdotally, we've had a lot of people coming to us and asking us, you know, off the record, what do we recommend? Um, lots of questions about where to get a VR headset, which one to get. 
primary incest is very much in quest. Um, it's been, people are often citing it as, they're seeing it as comparable to Wii Sports or Wii Fit. It's another one of those things that brings gaming into the house, but also, you know, has a fitness element that kind of helps justify it in parent size. The people uh, paying for them, you know, really like to see all the different things. So people always ask about the Quest. They always ask about PlayStation VR. And they always ask about Beat Saber. So Beat Saber seems to be the very common touch point that's kind of really linked with VR in the wider cultural zeitgeist. Um, looking outside the consumer sector, the location-based experiences have been really badly hit. And there was lots of uh, projects in the pipeline uh, in the arts sector that had been funded uh, as location-based experiences, and they've all had to be cancelled or, you know, put on the back burner for now. So that's seen a lot of kind of businesses in that sector struggling, unfortunately. Medical and wellness uh, sectors continue to grow. They're doing very, very well. Um, although I can tell you from experience, they can be quite tricky to work in because, you know, everything's regulated, everything's scrutinised all the time. So that can slow down the kind of fast, agile development that we usually are used to in this sector. Um, and we've seen generally that lots of things are being put on hold uh, while COVID was being assessed uh, and that plans are being put together and things are being figured out. And it's kind of been six months now. And what we are generally seeing is there's been a movement towards an increased understanding of the XR opportunities that are there. People are uh, definitely seeing how it can benefit their businesses. So we think it's going to kind of uh, get people moving in that direction once the situation becomes a little bit clearer about what the real return to work and everything's going to be. Talking a little bit more detail about COVID then, uh, we've seen an increasingly strong business demand for VR tech. We've seen a surge in consumer interest. You can look on Google Analytics and look at the search terms that have been most popular. It's really spiked for all the different VR keywords. Um, supply shortages are definitely becoming a factor um, that have kind of held back some of the success over the last six months or so. Uh, and no Quest restocks um, because they were waiting for Quest 2. That's actually been in place for quite a few months and they've been very, very hard to get hold of. Pardon me. As I said, location based entertainment in the West is looking severely maimed by um, different um, on the other side of uh, the world. Uh, where their culture is much more geared around that and they seem to have coped quite well. So there is still hope for that sector that we can get learnings from there. Working from home on uh, VR, the big problem with it, it's great. We've all attended, so, uh, well, you know, plenty of us will have attended VR conferences and things like that. Um, but the problem is everybody at work can't use a user. If the developer's working on VR, you know, one of the challenges is not everybody has a VR headset on the desk as a developer. Not everybody has one at home. So that kind of causes a problem. But in, in, you know, in other ways, um, VR development's not been really that badly impacted. We've seen lots of businesses that have adapted really, really easy and pivoted and just moved on. Um, and one of the things that we've seen is while we can definitely see that the benefits of meeting in VR and you know, having your um, work meetings and things like that in VR, those benefits aren't apparent to people yet because Zoom is so, you know, that sort of video call is so easily accessible, so readily accessible for everybody that that's bound to be the preferred uh, way of communicating, even though VR could solve a lot of the problems that people have with this format. Um, looking at virtual reality then. So we've seen a slight contraction this year um, in the VR market. It's certainly not the growth that we're expecting. It's entirely attributed down to COVID. Other than COVID, that kind of point, not uh, seven billion drop that we've seen um, it would be a big increase we think um, everything else was tracking up to the start of the um, virus impact in March April everything was tracking to uh, meet the forecast that it would be a really good uh, year on year growth this year we've seen that success is possible for developers even this uh, oculus announced at Facebook uh, direct 35 quest developers have now earned over a million in revenue and out of those 10 of them have earned two million plus in revenue. So that's a really, really good sign. PlayStation VR, Oculus Quest, Rift 2, Valve Index, Vive Pro, all looking healthy in sales, install users, number of users uh, on Steam. With a lot of this data, obviously, we nobody has the full picture um, because not all companies release their data. So we have to try and kind of piece uh, these things together. What we are seeing is it's a sign of a maturing <clears throat> marketplace with VR because we've seen lots of different offerings at different price points, different quality levels, uh, which is a very good thing for the consumer, obviously. 
Looking at PlayStation VR then, this always surprises people because um, it's the biggest VR platform. It's over 5 million users as of the start of January 2020. Who knows what they'll be up to now. It accounts for 43% of all the VR hardware sales in the last two years, which is a, a, a staggering number. And yet PlayStation VR is often forgotten about or just kind of put on one side as well. That's a, you know, it's a separate thing. It's its own little thing. But it's actually making a big, big effort to kind of popularise VR amongst the mainstream. While it has been technically outdated, you have to remember that with PlayStation users, a lot of them, uh, PlayStation VR is their first taste of VR. So, you know, even though the screen isn't as great as um, more up-to-date headsets, the tracking isn't as great as more up-to-date headsets, the magic of VR is fantastic. And some of the experiences on PlayStation VR, I know I'm biased because, you know, we come from a Sony background. Sony spend an awful lot of money uh, on their very top titles, making sure they're absolutely fantastic user experiences, absolutely polished, absolutely have that PlayStation quality level to them. And that's overall, we see as a really big benefit to VR because it sets a high bar for everybody else to come to. Some of these that you've seen on the screen here, that's just 10 of their exclusives. They've got a lot of exclusive titles on the platform. Some of them are only timed exclusive. Some of them, it's only the VR content that's exclusive. But it means that um, PlayStation VR keeps selling because a lot of the very best games, some of the very highest rated games on the platform, are held up as standard bearers in various genres um, within the gaming community. Um, PlayStation VR is often the only place to go to get some of these uh, titles. It has been confirmed to be PlayStation 5 compatible. Uh, nobody knows about PlayStation VR 2 yet, and if we knew, we wouldn't be allowed to tell you. Um, but what PlayStation 5 will offer to PlayStation VR users is a massive, massive power boost. There's all sorts of things that developers can use that for in conjunction with the existing hardware. Looking at Oculus Quest, then, as we know, it's hugely successful, very high levels of penetration. Um, there's a few tricky things for developers, right? Content curation policies are great for those that get the foot in the door with Oculus. If you get a title on the platform, it can do really, really well. But Oculus very much have, with Quest have been op operating a curated portfolio of titles, uh, best in class examples of all different genres and kind of variations on the popular ones. So if you manage to get in there, as we've seen, the rewards can be great. And um, they've also got very strict pricing policies uh, on, Quest, on Quest, as any new uh, platform holder would be expected to do. Um, but they've definitely stayed away from some of the problems that they've seen um, with Steam and with the Oculus Store for Rift, where there's just a kind of glut of, you know, budget price, things always in the sale, and it kind of brings the quality level down. So certainly in that first year, they've really worked hard to maintain the quality level uh, and make that very visible. It seems to have been very successful for them. They've been doing lots of development to the platform this year. They've introduced all sorts of things that you wouldn't necessarily expect any other headset developer to be pushing so aggressively. But all these things, finger tracking, the pass-through cameras, the AI learning, they've got the UI refinement, um, the social avatars and stuff, they've been working on lots and lots and lots and reiterating through different products, it's all informing their future products. They're working very, very smart and they're also working very, very fast. Um, one of the problems obviously is Facebook's public persona has kind of decayed over the last few years and continues to do so. And that's causing a little bit of a divide. Certainly we've seen in the hardcore users, there's a switch to people uh, most of them are going to uh, Valve or Vive um, because they just kind of is more open policy and they're more comfortable with the ethics of the company behind it. Um, but as I said, they move very fast. If you think about it, Oculus Go only came out in May 2018. That's only 28 months ago. It's two and a quarter, two and a third years ago. It's not long at all. If you think about that in, in terms that I can relate to because time means nothing anymore, as we all know. We were watching Avengers Infinity War, it wasn't that long ago, when Oculus Go came out and it was hailed as this great advancement and it was really going to unlock the market and everything. Only a year later, we are watching Avengers Endgame, it was fantastic. Oculus Quest came out, and Oculus Quest was like, absolutely cancelled out everything about Oculus Go, wasn't necessary anymore, and Oculus Go's, you know, quickly died off and is not a thing for Oculus anymore. And now we're October, and we're already, you know, it's kind of not even been out a year and a half, and we're looking at the release of Oculus Quest 2, which is super exciting. For future reference, I've just made a little note on it that we were all sitting around watching crap on Netflix when this happened. So when Oculus Quest 3 comes out, I've got a reference point. So talking about Oculus Quest 2 then, um, there's improvements across the board. Uh, it's smaller, it's lighter, 
Uh, it's got the soft strap now, although there is, is an optional hard strap, which is supposed to be absolutely fantastic. It's uh, much better uh, than anything Oculus have done before in terms of the ergonomics. Overall, people who've tried it, mine's on order, I'm waiting for it to come, um, have said it feels a lot cheaper on the outside than the existing Quest does. But once you're inside, it doesn't really matter because it's so much better. Snapdragon XR2 processor, which is uh, significantly more powerful than the processor they had in the Quest 1. And crucially, this time it's been designed purposely for VR. Um, so there'll be all sorts of tricks and things they can do with it that were, just weren't possible before. Um, that Snapdragon processor unlocks 90 hertz for them on the device as well. Original Quest ran at 72, but we warned at launch most of the titles are still going to run at 72. They're treating it as an experimental feature for now. But as I understand it, they're going to be rolling out their front end menus and the store and things periodically, converting them up to 90 hertz and kind of checking it out that way. Um, it's up to 3.5 megapixels per eye, which is massive. It was 2.5 megapixels per eye in the Quest 1, so that's a significant increase. And it's a different sub-pixel array, which basically the effect of that is if you're familiar with the screen door effect on Oculus devices, it's done away with it apparently um, because of the pentile arrangement of the uh, panel. The panel is LCD now, it's not an OLED, which is great in a way. Uh, because it means there's no smearing anymore, but it also means there's no deep blacks possible. Um, so it's a kind of trade-off, but I tend to think it's the right way to go. Um, one of the interesting things is they've had to compromise the IPD settings on it. So um, if you're familiar with the Quest, it's got a little slider underneath that lets you change uh, your eye distance, your interpupillary distance. Um, on Quest 2, there are three preset settings. You can have 58 millimeter, 63 millimeter, or 68 millimeter. And to actually adjust them, you have to put your fingers inside the device and shuffle the things about on little ratchets, which seems like a, a cost cutting uh, exercise. But as I understand it, there will be software adjustment for IPD within those ranges. So in theory, it should be a sensible cost cutting thing. Certainly the price that they're launching this at is amazingly competitive for what you're getting out of the box. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, they've changed the controllers. There's more powerful haptics in the controllers and the battery life is said to be up to four times longer, which is such a godsend because my quest just eat batteries. They're awful. You know, you have to set the batteries out because they seem to wake all the time. And you put a new battery in, next time you come to it, it's flat every time. So I'm very glad about that. Um, and overall, they're continuing to kind of move everything more closely to the Facebook business. It's, everything's getting much more emphasised to the link to their social platform. Um, which is their business and it makes sense. We were honestly a little bit surprised that it wasn't called the Facebook Quest 2, um, but maybe the Facebook Quest 3, I could see that as a, you know, quite a possibility in a couple of years time. Um, and they kind of revamping their social platform. They've, they've uh, historically had lots of different social apps uh, like Facebook Spaces and all sorts of different things, Facebook Rooms, um, new version of venues coming out uh, and their new social platform is launching alongside it. So hopefully all those you know, years of learning all the way since um, Rift first launched in their first social platform will result in something absolutely fantastic. And I can expect it will tie in very, very closely integrate with Facebook. Um, Desktop VR is, of course, the platform of choice uh, for the aficionados, and that's where all the expensive hardware, all the, you know, very best top performing games in terms of hardware performance can be found, the things that are really going to stretch your systems. So, as we saw, we're approaching 3 million monthly connected VR users. That number's not going down. Half-Life bumped it up an awful lot, and we've retained those users within VR, which is fantastic. Um, there are multiple marketplaces on PC, on Mac, but Steam still absolutely dominates by a huge amount. But one of the problems they've got, as I mentioned earlier, is this glut of kind of average to poor VR content, uh, which means that getting your game noticed can be really, really challenging. And unfortunately, it's one of the few open platforms that has a significant enough user base uh, that if you want to hit it big with an indie title, Steam's kind of be, got to be one of the platforms that you're including, if you, even if it's not the uh, major one that you're going for. Oculus stuff still works. Um, you know, if you've got a Vive and stuff like that, it's a fairly easy workaround. It's still a little bit more awkward than it needs to be. And there's still disagreements about whose fault it is. But there are ways around it. It's not ideal. So these exclusives that Facebook has on their platform aren't necessarily exclusives. Um, but who long, who knows how long that will last? Because that's something that Oculus could terminate at any time if they purely wanted to play in their own wall garden. 
Um, but Oculus do seem to be moving away from desktop VR in, in favour of their Quest PC link and an entirely um, Quest-based ecosystem. Moving on very quickly to mixed reality, we'll be very quick because there's not a lot of news in mixed reality, really. It's pretty quiet gaming-wise. Uh, Magic Leap was the thing that was pushing a lot of gaming in mixed reality, and they've now completely pivoted uh, to enterprise um, within the last year. What we are seeing is that AR on smartphones is very, very fast approaching MR capabilities. The f problem is that you've got to hold it in your hand, and that, that interface problem causes all sorts of issues that will go away when it becomes a wearable. So they're definitely on that trajectory, and I think one day, you know, AR won't really be a thing so much anymore because uh, there'll be better ways to kind of get that information that people will be quite accepting of. Um, and there's nothing to note on the HoloLens front, gaming-wise, still very much enterprise focus. They've not really done uh, much in terms of showcase gaming experiences or anything this year, so nothing much to report. Augmented reality, on the other hand, it's huge. It's absolutely huge, but it's kind of not what you think it is. Um, there's more than one billion AR-capable devices out there being used by the public. 334 million users active using AR apps uh, every day, apparently. And so it continues to be hugely popular, but the problem is a lot of these apps are basically not really kind of being used for their AR capabilities. So five out of the top 10 um, apps on smartphones last year had AR features. But when I tell you the Snapchat and kind of, you know, Facebook Messenger, Facebook, things like that, they're just those kind of overlays. Facebook have done some really cool things. Apple have done some really cool things with it. But the take up of people actually um, making good kind of um, AR experiences that are reaching the public and that are kind of really igniting their passion for AR seems to be quite small. Pokemon Go, obviously, is the big one, but Pokemon Go has been the number one AR title since 2016. And while it's got 100 million downloads and loads of active users, a lot of these other games, Ingress, uh, the Harry Potter game, the Jurassic Park game, and there's plenty of others, Ghostbusters, there's all sorts of things hew very closely to that same formula. And those games are really GPS-based games, the geocaching games, um, that have got AR as an additional element. So kind of true AR games are thinner on the ground. The sort of numbers that we see in for users on those sort of games are 10 million and less. So while it's a huge thing and everybody's aware of AR, the number of games that are actually exploiting it and kind of people are playing is much smaller than you might think. Um, and again, Facebook and Apple wearables will solve a lot of this problem, but they're probably still two or three years away. That's it for my update. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Jed. That was a fantastic uh, look into um, the, the XR market. That was brilliant. Uh, if it's okay with you, um, uh, we'll come back and uh, ask some questions um, for the panel a bit later on, if that's okay. Of course, yeah. Great stuff. Right. Well, I think we'll crack on. Uh, so we're going to uh, XR stories now. Uh, and so I hand over to uh, Marion and to Caroline and Kate. OK, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick in and, and say hello whilst I'm, I'm sharing my screen uh, to get the presentation going. We, we don't, we're going to try to do a triple act, if you believe it or not. Hopefully not too many. Uh, cock-ups. <laughs> and here we are. Uh, so we are XR Stories and, and a bit later on uh, we are uh, going to talk about another initiative uh, that is called SIGN uh, from University of York at the moment. Um, I am uh, Marian Urso. Uh, Caroline White is, is a colleague of mine and, and Kate O'Connor. Um, we, we are uh, uh, in the management team of uh, uh, XR Stories. Uh, and what, what we'd like to do is refresh the memory about what uh, uh, XR Stories is. Um, maybe then uh, give a few examples of what we've done since, uh, since we were set up and then an invitation for collaboration for the next year uh, presenting our next major uh, call for proposals. Um, okay, so start, start, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, it's, there's a torrential 
oh my goodness, I think I'm going to die. This torrential rain outside. <laughs> I got very, very distracted by this. Um, XR Stories is um, one of the creative uh, uh, industries uh, clusters. Um, uh, the um, creative industries uh, uh, cluster program uh, is funded from the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. There's around 56 million that were invested in, in this. Uh, it runs from October 2018 to March 2023. Uh, and from this program, uh, nine clusters of creative industries, most of them uh, uh, screen, screen industries, but a couple in fashion were funded. And you can see them here uh, on the map, one, uh, uh, two in Scotland, one in Northern Ireland, uh, then uh, two in, in uh, uh, the north, in, in York and Leeds, and, and the rest in, in the south. Uh, and out of these, um, Quite a few are relevant to the games industries. Uh, uh, the one in Dundee, in-game, is, is actually targeting the games industry. And then uh, uh, future screens in Northern Ireland, XR Stories in York, uh, the uh, uh, Bath and Bristol uh, a cluster, and Story Futures in London uh, uh, all deal with, uh, uh, with a significant part of, of the game industry. Uh, in, in XR Stories, in, in, uh, which is run from York, um, we, we try to foster and, and, and uh, develop Yorkshire and Humber screen industries as a center of excellence in immersive and interactive digital storytelling. That's why we got the money uh, and, and that's what we want to, to, to push forward. And we collaborate with Screen Yorkshire uh, uh, and and with BFI um, and of course we have funding from uh, 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 Innovate UK, from Cry, uh, Ucry and from the Industrial Strategy. Uh, why Yorkshire and Humber? Uh, it's, it's good to see this, this uh, uh, statistic which was gathered by, by Screen Yorkshire. Um, it has the fastest rate, the fastest rate of, of uh, uh, screen industry growth in the UK, 247% uh, uh, against the UK's average of 118. That's, that's really amazing. Uh, an annual production turnover of, of uh, uh, 343 million uh, with the uh, gross uh, value added of 163. And we have in, in Yorkshire and Humber 670 film TV and games companies. So it's really a, a major part of, of, of the industry. And we have 5,700 people directly employed. What do we do in XR Stories? We want, we got money to, in, to then invest back into uh, uh, screen industries to foster research and development. And we partner uh, uh, research with industry, we fund initiatives uh, uh, and allow the industry a bit of breathing space to innovate uh, and, and the industry gets, gets money to, to be able to, to release uh, uh, resources to, to engage in that. Um, we've started uh, 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 24 months ago. We, we have four and a half years uh, to go. Oh, I'm sorry, we have four and a half years funding, so two and a half years more to go. Um, we've so far engaged with 40 individual SMEs in, uh, um, in the area, and we kind of operate through seven regional universities. York is the main hub, but, but we work through all the universities. And so far, we've invested in, in uh, our local industry, uh, film, TV production and games, uh, 2.2 million, of which 700 and over 750,000 went directly into the industry to allow them to release resources and engage in, in, in R&D. Uh, and, and this is the point where Caroline will step in and, and uh, give a little overview of our funded projects. So thanks, Marion. Um, can you hear me okay, everyone? Yeah. Um, so we funded quite a wide range of projects and it ranges from um, AR, VR, people looking at interactive narrative in different ways. So ultimately what binds, what we're looking for are things that advance storytelling. 
um, and they either could be tools or platforms or stories themselves or completely new ways of audiences engaging and interacting. So that's pretty broad. We have people from theatre and the arts all the way through to very technical back-end projects to either provide you know, new ways for people to interact or do that with TV or simply very games related projects. Um, so what we've got here is a bit of a cross section. We've got um, an AR learning app um, for kids, um, which is kind of mobile based and uh, publishing based. We've got uh, Storyland from Emma, who's on the panel, which is an amazing project about kids being able to create their own stories in VR whether that's drawing, creating characters, which is really exciting. Um, we've got one from Dubbit on the far right here, which is all about um, uh, VR. And uh, I think the latest version of this is like a squash game from the future. So it's all about getting people um, to exercise and get into gyms. Um, and then uh, on the bottom, we've got um, a pure games project um, called Live by the Sword. Um, some stuff around uh, from Beta Jester in the middle and then a really lovely project about projection mapping a game onto buildings and huge surfaces so that people can play them in real time. So really broad range of stuff. Um, yeah, that, thanks. That's great. Marion, next. Uh, yeah. So in terms of who we have funded or who we're in contact with, it's really broad. As I said, there's Probably the biggest capability is really obviously, you know, people with games, XR tech capability, but it also includes people from arts, museums, kind of marketing, ad industry and TV. Um, and then the sectors they work in can be really different. So sometimes it's a games company doing a games project. Sometimes it's a games company doing an arts project or something completely different. So even if you are your capable, I think anyone with games capability is really, really valuable. How you think about interactive, the fact that you can build things, um, so pivotal to everything that we fund. Um, next slide, Marion. Um, so yeah, um, these are two projects. I don't know if we have time to go into them in detail, um, but Marion, do you want to say a little bit about those yes, two. It, it, Jamie, do, do we have time to just a couple of minutes on each? Yeah, I think we've got about sort of two or three minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, the first one uh, on, on the left, uh, um, uh, University of York partnered with uh, Revolution Software to investigate how deep learning could now be used in asset creation and and uh, um, the the game that that one of the games that revolution software uh, have a, a, a huge fan base for uh, very much relies on uh, um, the the style that that the artist uh, uh, um, uh, uh, uses in 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 drawing the the landscape the the environment uh, and and we've successfully shown that that deep learning could be used to learn the style of a particular uh, draftsman and apply that style to to elements of of content and we've investigated textures like uh, bricks and and trees and so we started with simpler simpler structures but but the proposition is there and we continue to fund in in this line of work which is which is very very appears to be quite quite lucrative. Um, Caroline, would you like to talk about Fear Skate you or? Yeah, um, I'm just going to quickly, uh, so this is a really, really lovely project, a VR project, um, really using a very famous voice, um, which was just exploring, um, like transporting you to a different world, really. And uh, there's a lot of really lovely tactile stuff in there that uh, they got to test out about picking things up and hearing things, which is really, really lovely. Um, I think we better move along, Marion, if that's okay. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so um, um, that's kind of the past and the context for what we do. And, and in 2021, we're now working to set up a challenge that addresses directly film and, and TV experiences and film and TV production. Um, and 
what we the, the model that we're we're uh, uh, adopting is to have conversations with with large uh, uh, production companies with broadcasters large film production companies um, that come on board identify some challenges and then offer support mentoring access to assets master classes technology support and uh, the the actual uh, uh, more important thing is that hopefully uh, they will also offer commissioning uh, uh, opportunities for for uh, those great ideas. And and here on this slide, we have the partners that we're in a, a conversation with: BBC, Channel Four, Sky, BT Sport, uh, Basilevs in Russia, Warp Films, uh, Screen Yorkshire, Epic, and Un. What is this program about? Well, and how is it going to operate? Uh, uh, Businesses from our clusters, uh, from our cluster, will apply and will be selected to deliver projects that uh, uh, address some of the challenges that we'll publish. Um, uh, the teams should integrate research capability that exists in the cluster, uh, including interactive storytelling, AI, virtual reality, immersive audio, uh, and, and, and the sort. Um, XR stories fund then the uh, selected projects uh, and, and the teams will consist of film and TV production companies, uh, but we, they also need uh, experience in interactive experiences, software development, uh, and, and that is something that the game industry could, could bring. Um, XR stories also will provide business and technical support throughout the development of, of the project and hopefully successful projects will then be taken further for investment. And to reiterate, uh, uh, why have we brought this here? It's film and TV challenge, but we believe the games company have, could play a major role in this. Uh, first of all, to help film and TV production companies who are very experienced in linear storytelling to develop new concepts that are interactive, immersive, then provide the expertise throughout the development phase of, of the, the process in interactive storytelling and more generally in interactive and immersive experiences. Also provide the technical expertise, which very much sits with, with the programmers in, in the games industries. Uh, and uh, they, they, we could also foresee kind of combinations of gamified experiences with narrative experience to make a, a, a richer concept. Um, and maybe Caroline, you want to talk about yeah, the resources that we have? I think we I know you probably need to finish, finish up, Jamie. And um, just quickly as well, we also have another project which is funded uh, from the European Union, and that's to provide access to XR equipment to any lead city region businesses. So that includes headsets, we've got some volumetric stuff, and um, we've got software. Uh, we do have a lab which we're building, which was supposed to be open, but it won't now be open until the end of January. But what we can do in the meantime is if any of you are interested with experimenting or accessing could be sound stuff, just get in touch with us and mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what we can do to help you, especially if you're just trialing something and you don't know that you want to invest. And maybe, Jamie, you'll also allow us uh, to, to have a, a two, three minute description of yet another big investment that we got at University of York and, 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 and Kate will, will give a, a brief overview of Sign Screen Industries Growth Network. Kate. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you. I will tr honestly try to keep it to two minutes because um, I'm very proud to be a co-director of XR Stories. Um, it's brilliant in providing the fourth pillar of growth for the Yorks and Humber plan to make Yorkshire the uh, best and largest screen industry cluster in the UK. And obviously we've got international ambitions as well. And, but I'm here today to just add in a little trailer to this new program called SIGN, the Screen Industries Growth Network. It pretty much does what it says on the tin, this one. So I'm not going to explain in too much detail, but a year in to the work of XR Stories and with our eye on growing our screen industries overall in Yorkshire, we decided we would put in another ambitious bid to another funding body to develop uh, uh, and address all the huge challenges that the industry is facing, whether they're current skills gaps and shortages or anticipating what they might be in, in, the, in relation to XR, whether it's about preparing for new storytelling formats, whether it's understanding better audience reaction, 
routes to market, business and leadership, et cetera, et cetera. The usual suspects, actually, in terms of challenges, but rooted around a really practical program of uh, strands of work that will support growth. A wraparound to XR stories is how I sometimes describe it. This is a, a funding uh, baby that was conceived out of COVID, but born in lockdown. Um, it runs in a parallel uh, timescale to XR Stories. So we started work in March and we'll run to 2023. There are four major areas of work. One is all about research, audience, horizon scanning, finding out what's happening, making sure that it's all fed back to our businesses and our, um, our universities in Yorkshire. The second is all about skills and talent development. The third is all about business support. Uh, which will be at, for all sizes and scales of businesses in Yorkshire to help support growth. And then running alongside all of those three, but described as a separate strand is about diversity, because this is an issue uh, that we absolutely need to do something about. And not just diversity, but uh, inclusivity and equity uh, in terms of access to our products, our markets, our businesses, our employment. So, so SIGN is all about putting money behind all of those initiatives and working as closely as we can with businesses. And that's why the partnership with Game Republic is essential uh, as for, for games um, and your network, Jamie. It's why we work closely with Screen Yorkshire as well for film and TV. We're going to be announcing a whole slate of really interesting projects um, now from September through to March, which will be piloted but we want to work really closely with you and your network and your contacts to make sure everything we do is relevant to the game sector in Yorks and Humber. So I will leave it there because there's a lot more I could say and maybe there'll be another chance to say it, but watch out for sign because it's going to be the network that will help grow the industries and will be part of your business future. Thank you. And maybe to strengthen that in, invite, Kate, also watch out for XR Stories as uh, the film and TV challenge will, will be published uh, early next year uh, and will call for some networking events uh, uh, towards the end of this year. And I think it's a great opportunity for, for, for this network to, to, uh, to participate. So we, we hope we'll, we'll get, we'll get uh, lots of you knocking at, at our door. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Brilliant. Short. <laughs> thank you very much thank you um to marion uh, caroline and kate there so um that's xr stories and sign as well um brilliant stuff um is there any chance you could put um, some contact details in the chat bit of the um of the zoom just so if anybody wants to contact you they can get in touch um sorry kate could you shut off your video for some reason I, i'm not appearing on here for some reason um it's <laughs> it keeps, keeps cutting me off but um yeah, so if, um, if anybody wants to get in touch with XR Stories or with um, the guys from Sign, then um, they'll put some info in the chat bit. So uh, I think now we're going to have a, a chat with Steve Tagger. So hello, Steve, are you there? I am, yeah. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Um, That's good. I, think, I, think, you, yeah, you, so I was going to say you're very lucky because we've hit the point where my kids come home from school and start to <laughs> throttle... Um, the bandwidth with the PS4 and the Xbox. So. Good stuff. Well, good, good timing all round. But uh, uh, so uh, just before we go to the panel, we're just going to have a quick catch up with you and End Dreams. Find out what you've been up to. So you, you basically launched a couple of games recently. How how's that gone? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's gone really well. I mean, probably the, I mean just for the people that don't know End Dreams, um, we we've been in VR since 2013. Um, in fact, last weekend we celebrated our 14th. Um, anniversary as a company um, but in 2013 we pivoted to VR. Um, we are now 110 people um, running across three different teams um, so you know we, we are fully committed um, to VR and um, kind of the brave new world that Jed laid out um, a little bit earlier on um, and yeah we recently launched um, a couple of games so in June we launched Phantom um, which Last year, when there was an E3, um, won the um, Game Critics Award for the best VR game, which was um, 
you know, I've been in video games 20 years. It's the first time I've won it. Obviously, I'm taking all the credit. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, so that was that was really exciting. And then from there, um, kind of we rolled forward and started moving towards launch in June this year. Obviously, in March, COVID happened. And that kind of, I think it's quite, you know, we, we talk about COVID and the impacts um, on the development side, but it's also worth kind of considering actually the impact on the publishing side as well. So we went from kind of um, a publishing plan, which has key beats around things like GDC and E3, whereby obviously we'd have all the influencers together in one place and we'd get the previews and the reviews. And now we've moved to kind of a more um, digital um, first kind of program, which obviously requires a lot more video and a lot more social. And so we had to kind of adjust quite a bit for that. Um, one of the things that we've been working on and we, that we did that worked really well was we brought, um, we announced David Hayter as the kind of villain of the piece, um, which, you know, that worked really well. Um, obviously, you know, Phantom is an action stealth game and there isn't really a bigger name in, in stealth than, than David Hayter. Um, and he supported it really brilliantly. And that, that, that kind of scanned really well. And that kind of filled in some of the kind of um, some of the beats that we may have lost around something like a GDC. Not to say we, you know, we'd have got maybe more if you were able to do that at a GDC, but it certainly mm -hmm. kind of allows and helps to create that awareness um, outside of those key events. And I think when you talk about kind of the growth of VR and things like the David Hayter um, involvement in the projects, what we started to find from the last E3 and kind of running through to launch is VR is starting to break out of that kind of um, bubble of kind of um, journalism, which was focused kind of solely on the VR press. We were starting to get coverage a lot. You know, you're seeing more coverage in the wider gaming press, partly driven by a lot of the IPs that are coming, you know, into VR. Um, and we're also starting to see kind of national press start to cover um, some of the things. So, so that again is, is kind of hugely beneficial when you, you kind of build into a launch. Um, as I say, video and stuff like that was really important, but working closely as well, I mean, a bit of kind of advice to any developers kind of looking to get into VR, working really closely um, with the platforms and trying to kind of um, understand what things work well and working closely with them is also really important. I mean, Phantom, you know, is an Oculus Studios title. So, you know, Oculus have been brilliant on that project and supported us really well. But again, it is really important to understand kind of the best way to reach your audience, um, even more so, like I say, because of stuff like COVID. Um, so there's kind of the, the, the shift in the market and how it works is, is really kind of interesting and important to kind of, I, I say for anyone who is um, looking to develop games in VR, think about mm. as well, you know, the market from a, from a publishing side. Naturally, you know, my background is, is commercial. Um, so, you know, obviously I, I tend to have a little bit of a focus on that, but it is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of kind of a bit more advice around launch, building a community, you know, was really important for Phantom. So, you know, again, you know, DC, who heads up the publishing team and his team did a fantastic job building the momentum, creating a strong brand and an IP um, that really kind of mapped well to the game. You know, things like Hater coming in was, was really important to that. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I keep harking back to that, but, you know, on, on our, our, the games that kind of we're working on, um, at the moment, um, we're, all, we're already kind of having that con conversation of kind of what can be that hater beat or that hater moment um, going forward. How do you get something to kind of come into it? But building community, building engagement, um, you know, you look at stuff like um, Boneworks, what they've done, um, obviously with, you know, early access, getting demos out to people, getting a community on board, working with that VR community that's very active, um, and kind of giving back. And you also see that with Onward as well, which, you know, has done phenomenally well. Um, and now, you know, also doing phenomenally well on Quest since its launch, you know, it's, you know, it's huge credit um, to the way that they've kind of built that, that community and that engagement um, that that is doing so well. And obviously shout out to Coat Sync and the team there for, for kind of their great work on it, uh, work on it too. So, so Phantom, you know, that's, that's kind of a quick potted thing about Phantom mm. and then, and Shooty Fruity, we also launched in um, August of this year. So, you know, releasing one game um, in COVID wasn't enough. We decided that, you know, two months later, we'll release another one. Um, 
Um, and this is slightly different because what we did is we brought Shooty Fruity, it's been successful on other platforms. You know, PSVR was the highest rated shooter at one time um, on PSVR. And for those who don't know Shooty Fruity, it's a kind of mix of a, a job simulation and a wave shooter. And so you have to kind of do the checkout and scan all the produce whilst you're shooting hordes of mutant fruit that is, is coming towards you. So it's, it's perfect for VR. You know, it's, it's exactly that kind of um, transportation to, to kind of an experience that you, that you couldn't have. Um, and so we brought that, which is a successful IP that has also worked in the arcades. We brought that to, um, to Quest. And because it's a kind of known IP, um, again, this, this kind of talks to the, the marketing and the publishing elements. We knew that the audience is slightly different. So, so we slightly aged it up a little bit. We looked at the proposition and we looked again at what's working in the market. We know, you know mixed reality, uh, MR trailers and, and video is working phenomenally well um, in, in VR and, and plays very well with, with the Quest audience. Um, it allows players to kind of get context. You only have to see how well stuff like, you know, Pistol Whip and Beat Saber have done, you know, obviously great games in their own right, um, you know, huge games in their own right, but also, you know, the, the, the kind of um, mixed reality and seeing people mm. play it has really helped players understand what it is. They get it instantly and then they, you know, so they are more comfortable just jumping straight in because they know exactly what to expect. So we put again, a lot of mixed reality into the proposition. We, you know, we put, you know, a, a person into the key art, into the trailers and everything. So players can, can understand immediately what the game and what the proposition is and what they're going to be doing. And that, that's a real kind of um, important thing again um, for, for teams that are looking to kind of, uh, or that are already working in VR or looking to get into it. You know, again, think of that, you know, it's really important. You see it, um, you know, we saw it in the arcade side um, because again, shooty fruity, you walk into an arcade uh, or, you know, a, a mom and pop arcade and you just see lots of people doing this. It's like, well, what game are they, you know, if you're not looking at the second screen, what <laughs> game are they playing? Are they playing shooty fruity? Are they playing beat saber? Are they playing, if they're playing pistol, they're probably ducking a lot more. But it's, 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 it's that kind of thing. So as soon as you can see that player in the context, because, you know, take Richie's plank. If you just see someone without, and, and you can't understand what they're doing, and they're just kind of steadily walking along the floor, what does that mean? Well, it suddenly means something when you can see them on a, you know, that person on a plank in VR, you know, high above kind of the highest buildings, which for me is terrifying because I'm, I'm scared of heights. But it, it really gets it across. So these, you know, these kind of things that, that we're learning as we're kind of marketing to, to, to the kind of VR consumer or the wider consumer that's looking to get into VR mm. um, are really important and really kind of are things that, that, that developers and the marketing teams or, or marketeers working with developers should be um, consider, considering as they go into it. So I kind of just, I know you're tight for time, but I just wanted to kind of cram all that into, into, into a couple of minutes. Yeah, no, that was great. It was really fascinating to hear. And um, it's good that that even you know, during these times that you still manage to get the message out and that people are buying games as well, which is really important because yeah, you know, I've talked think... to quite a few companies that have had to launch games, obviously, during COVID. And they, they seem to be still selling games and doing doing well. Yeah. And, and the thing, so the thing you've got to be, so if you're doing kind of previews and reviews, you've got to be really confident that your code and supporting materials that you're sending out uh, are kind of uh, spot on. I mean, I think 20 years ago when I, you know, I was a lot younger, Jamie, I was PRing games to you. And, you know, the rule of kind of presenting a game or pitching a game is it's always going to go wrong. Well, you know, normally like at a show, Maybe you're that was there. just you though, Steve, you know. Possibly, <laughs> possibly, yeah. Mm. All right. Um, no. So yeah, and, and, but it is that you know it is that it is that you know it is that it all, something always goes wrong, and you're there to to kind of fix it or you know get it working. Now you you don't have that um, ability yeah. now, so everything has to work. The supporting materials have to be able to get across um, all the kind of important features or points of that game that that normally there would be. Um, you know, maybe it's a member of the dev team or it's the publishing team or the comms team or something that is going to be able to kind of talk through, you know, some of what's happening and actually no, now, you know, you can kind of, you can build up to it and you can, you can present it, but at the same time, that player is going to go away on their own and, and, you know, 
So everything has to work as you expect it. So all that, you've got to be really confident about all that stuff and, yeah, and not get me to present it because. <laughs> well, that's, that's great. Thanks, Steve. Um, I think we're going to roll into the, the panel now. I'd like to uh, introduce Emma. Emma Cooper has been waiting very patiently there in the wings um, to, uh, to take part in this. Hello, Emma. Are you all right? Hi. Hello. Good stuff. And um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, cooperative innovations? You got a, you got a bit of a mention earlier on um, with XR Stories, which was good. Yeah, yeah. Cooperative innovations. We're an immersive technology studio, so um, predominantly working on games. Um, so we just put out a VR game during COVID, which was lots of fun. Um, and we're also doing a fair amount of R&D supported by um, XR Stories, specifically looking at um, how children and young people respond to the premise of being in a world that they've created, um, which is lots and lots of fun. Um, and also we got awarded some funding to do some R&D into um, virtual live tours with museums and cultural destinations um, through an Innovate Fund, uh, specifically linked to COVID. So we do a variety of things. Good stuff, brilliant. Well, uh, I'm gonna go into the panel now. So um, one of the things that um, Steve was mentioning was about um, platform holder support. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, do, you, do you think that you, st you need the support or major funding actually of a platform holder before you make a VR game nowadays? Let's go to you, Emma. Say what you you think first of all, and then we'll yeah. see what the other. Folks I suspect think. <laughs> Steve's experience of the major platform holders has been considerably different than our experience. Um, and much like the early days, my background's in mobile gaming, and much like in the early days of the iOS store, um, unless you have the ear of the the people at the top, you are very much um, fighting to be heard. So it's um, it's a challenge. Hmm. Yes. Also, the amount of backing. So the amount is not just it's not just um, enthusiasm. It's also physical cash. So the amount the amount of support you get from a platform can make a huge difference. Hmm. Jed, you're you're dealing with a lot of. Um... You know, developers looking for opportunities with with um, VR and XR. Um, are you seeing um, platform holders still funding games from smaller developers, or are they moving into kind of higher budget um, productions now? It. I mean, it, it kind of depends. And this is this is all the same. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah this yeah. is all the Good. same problem that the games industry always faces. You know, it's just a, a slightly different tweak on it. Um, I mean, it helps, okay? Um, platform holders understand the games business better than a lot of other investment areas. So um, while they're kind of, you know, stricter and more careful in terms of what they add to the portfolio and when and when they present that, when mm. they kind of open things up to a wider range of developers, um, that's kind of just, I, we just see it as it, it's the same problem as the games industry. It's just, this is a niche within the games industry. So mm. there's even less opportunities, you know. Um, mm. It certainly helps, uh, as Emma says, to have a platform holder on your side. Um, but it doesn't mean that's the only way. You know, if you want to make a game, you can go out there and make a game. There, there are plenty of marketplaces and stuff like that. It's just, it's becoming harder by the day to kind of make it that way. It definitely helps if you've got somebody on your side, yeah. Mm. What about kind of, of gen... nice little places yeah, carry like on, Emma. Uh, side quest? So yeah. op the opportunity to put stuff out there, um, whilst to a certain extent Facebook are withholding, there are little niches that you can chuck stuff out in and get audience response really quickly. So I, I wouldn't withhold your creativity. Mm. Caroline, um, you know, with XR Stories, have you, you know, you're, you're obviously funding a few VR projects. Have you had some good input from the platform holders themselves? Have you been in touch with them? So not that much, no. Um, we, yeah, not that much. Like we've had more interest from the sectors that are interested in using VR, like in film and TV, but 
Oculus and the like. Um, there's a lot of enterprise focus from a lot of those platforms now. And so the niche for sort of storytelling, there's such an appetite in that sort of Bandersnatch, you know, people want that for IP. They're really interested. But in terms of, no, not so much from the Oculuses and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I would say is, though, as a community, it's still fairly small and there's a lot of help there. And people, well, games, the games industry is huge, isn't it? So the VR community, the amount of collaboration going on or people that are helping each other out is pretty amazing. So I think if you are getting into it, there's potentially... Yeah, hard, a lot more to do, but more help maybe to get there. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I would, I would, um, I'd echo that in terms of, you know, the VR community is a, you know, it's a, you know, I've, again, I've been in games a long time. It's a great community to be in. There is a whole heap of collaboration. Um, and I would say just, you know, get out there and speak to, you know, other developers, um, ask them what they did, how they did, you know, um, you know, my, my door, my email is always open. I will happily kind of, um, support or help any developer, um, kind of, because it is a, a rising tide raises all boats. It, this, this is where we are at the moment. We're not, we're not competing against one another. What we're trying to do is, is grow the market as a whole. So, um, that, you know, the more successful more developers are in vr the better for everyone because there's more people playing and that's that's the stage where we're at at the moment and that is why you do get this really healthy community where you know whether you know back in the old days when people could meet up it was you know they, they were really good places to to kind of spitball ideas or, or kind of you know find out you know how someone did something or you know again even just down to kind of what marketing works you know where is the audience? Mm. Who is the audience? You know, what demographic are you looking at on what platform? You know, all, all that advice can be hugely beneficial um, to anyone who's kind of looking to start out developing the game. It's like Jess says, this is no different to um, video games um, as it's always been. But, you know, at the moment, the community, you know, we're happy to help one another and that's a really nice place to be. Yeah, yeah. And what, what about sort of general kind of funding, you know, like VC funding or or you know SEIS and all that kind of stuff is it is VR still viable I mean there's quite a few of our companies in the region have you know have received um, quite significant investment over the last kind of six to 12 months so including cooperative innovations in Emma you know do, do you see it as being um, you know quite a, a good a good thing to be in VR for investment still yeah 100% I think um, the charts are all going up they're going up considerably slower than um, happened with mobile technologies but mobile technologies were an immediate easy sell vr is harder is a much harder sell um mm. and but i think the speed of transition the speed at which we got to the oculus quest 2 the difference the sheer difference in the last five years of the hardware and the fact that it's so much more accessible it's so like you could just i can give a set to a child that we're doing user testing with and they are off and they are running with it um whereas five or six years ago you'd have had to put stands up you would have you know you need three blokes and a dog to get it going and it's it's just it's so much more convincing so the numbers are all going up and um notable transitions in the market the switch from facebook from Oculus to Facebook, really sends very. Whilst the uh, the established community on unhappy about it, it sends hugely positive messages to investors because it says mass market. Yeah. It says that yeah. you know we're going to make this super easy for people. Um, and the, as as Steve rightly says, you know, rising tide, we will all do a lot better out of it. I think. It's it's all for the good. Mm -hmm. Investors are generally more positive about it as well, aren't they? It's not as speculative anymore. It's more of an own quantity. So you know, it's a it's a smarter, easier investment for them to make if everything's right. So we're no, certainly seeing that as it's maturing. Last week was a was a big week. You know, 
the Quest 2 at 299, that is, you know, that's a great pr price for, for a headset. I mean, anecdotally, that means I have another hundred pounds to spend on content because that's, that's what I'm going to do. So immediately that's going back into the, the kind of the, the developer community because I'm going to spend that on games. But, you know, at the same time, um, on the same day, Kosh Media, you know, bought Vertigo for 50 million. That's the first time a VR company has been built, bought by a third party publisher. So again, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot to be really positive about. Mm -hmm. Caroline, sorry, you were going to say something there. Yeah, no, um, we published like a list of funders, but um, there's Immerse UK are pretty good on that as well of anything that's out there. But yeah, in terms of investment, obviously there was a real dip in confidence, you know, a few years ago, but it does feel like it's rising again and HTC do an investment program. There's a, there is an interest from VCs, but um, the focus is really taken off on the enterprise side. And I think you're all right, like what the Quest 2 will do will be really interesting because there has been a lack of investment in the creative side for the last few years. So hopefully the tide will turn on that again. Um, mm. But there's a real shift towards AR, obviously, because of the glasses. So everybody's waiting for that. And there's a real interest in anything that can shift between the two or... I you know. think there's, there's a greater understanding now that that content can be viewed through either AR or VR. The content's still the content. And I think that this year, whilst it's been horrific, um, <laughs> it's still, from a digital creative point of view, it's it's been a spark. People that I've been talking to for years, my fa friends and family trying to explain what it is that I do, are suddenly like, should we have a Skype? Should we have a Zoom? And it's like all of a sudden digital media, the, the layer of digital that we've been creating and working on for the last 20 years, they're like, oh, I understand it now. And that these things are just windows. The phone is a window mm. into a virtual world. The headset is a more compelling window into that world i think that this this the setup of the ar versus vr is kind of it neither neither here nor there anymore sliding scale right yeah mm. yeah it's interesting that how you say that you know it's like almost all this zoom stuff that's happening all this video is almost like a gateway drug into into vr and and we've seen change attitudes change towards games from like the world health organization at the beginning of this year was saying that it was addictive and dangerous and then during the you know, pandemic of saying, actually, it's really good for your mental health. So, you know, things are, things are changing. I think, you know, I've had family get in touch with me and ask about, you know, what games consoles should they buy, you know, what's VR and all that kind of stuff. So I think, I think you know, that if there is a positive to come out of this situation, it's that people are becoming more aware of the, like you say, these digital worlds and these, these ways of, of interacting with people. It's like anything, isn't it? C customers need to know that they want it first. It's got to be answering a want that they've got. And if they don't know about VR or what it needs, they don't have that want yet. So traditionally, you put it on people's head and people go, that's amazing. Can I get one of these? Because you've created that need by showing it to them. Um, but it does feel like the kind of the benefits of VR, all the things it can bring, are slowly filtering through to the wider public. And they're starting to not just see it as it's a monitor on your head. But, you know, they're hearing enough stories and seeing enough success with it. They're going, oh, you may, maybe there's something in this. Maybe I'd like to try it, you know, which is great. Yeah, cool. Uh, well, I'm conscious of that we're sort of running out of time, but um, maybe each of you could um, give your kind of, um, you know, view on what's going to happen in the next sort of six to 12 months. If anybody's got any um, inside information on um, Apple's um, glasses or anything like that coming uh, <laughs> that they can reveal or show some stuff. But, um, you know, what, what do you, where do you think the market's going to be in sort of six to 12 months? Are we going to, because it, you know, Jed, we'll come to you first. You were saying that the market has kind of leveled off a bit this year. Um, but we've seen some successes, like obviously Alex, Half-Life Alex, which has mm. you know, doubled VR and things. So where do you see the market in the next six to 12 months? Will it depend on what happens with COVID or are we going to see that uh, like an uplift happen anyway? I think, I think this is a blip in the uplift that we've seen because of COVID. I think that you know, everybody's had lots of other problems. And while it's great for people to start going, actually, under the current circumstances, that sounds like the ideal thing that I want in my life now. Um, it takes people a while to realise that. And then, you know, as we've seen, it's taking people a while to get hold of them as well. So I do think, you know, to my mind, um, over that overall rise that we, we're seeing across all the XR industries, but particularly VR, where it's really starting to hit 
that inflection point. I think it's just like the needles just, you know, skip to track and it'll keep going mm. up in another six to 12 months. But it all depends on what happens with COVID, you know. Yeah. If we're all in this situation this time next year, I bet oh, lots God of people God will have our headset. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Steve, what about yourself? What do you, what do you see happening in the next six to twelve um, months? Well, I think I think it's a great six to twelve months for the consumers. Really, the 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 the, the players. You know, Jed said earlier about you know, PSVR has well over five million install base. You know, Minecraft's just come to VR. Hitman is coming. Um, there's a new Walking Dead game, Walking Dead Onslaught, launching this week. You know, you've got Medal of Honor. Um, the, the, Star the, Wars the squadrons. Jurassic, Star Wars squadrons. You know, this is in the next week. Um, you know, you've had Half Life. You've got what? Well, you've got the Jurassic World from from Coatsing, which looks great. Mist is you know th there is across each platform there is some great content. I think you're going to see people talking a lot more about the content, and content is what drives a lot of this. Mm -hmm. So you know, mm -hmm. you talking to your friends, and once you kind of layer in all the you know the mixed reality and the social side of it and everything. Um, I think you, you, you know, you, you see the consumer very happy and telling their friends about it. And, you know, like you say, if you're still in this situation, you, you're going to want to be involved and that's, you yeah, know, onward, yeah. onward is doing phenomenally well on quest, you know, and that's, um, you know, that's, that's multiplayer. So, you know, you're starting to see not just kind of, you can have inherently social single player experiences, but you also start mm. to see multiplayer as well. And you just start to see that grow and grow. So. Yeah, and obviously content-wise, um, Emma, with uh, yourselves and Space Team VR, you know, that's a very much a cooperative game. Do you see cooperative experiences becoming, you know, more and more the kind of norm, really, as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a purely, it's a social platform. Um, the thing that we keep saying to people, um, whilst we've been in lockdown, whilst we've been testing, um, actually testing within the game is much like being together as a group of people. And it's astounding like i really genuinely believe in this platform which for me is a remarkable thing to say because i used to think it was a lot of nonsense um <laughs> i've been proven wrong i think it's yeah we'll see more more social games i think um i'm really interested to see uh, more from facebook horizons i'm really interested to see more interesting kinds of platforms we were talking with maria at um five the other day and she's seen a lot of development in um social kind of uh, user based content um mm -hmm. and she's been doing a lot with film festivals around the world we saw um burning man um being somewhat unlocked for virtual reality um, I've always wanted to go to Burning Man and there was no way on God's earth that I was ever going to go, let alone do it in my pants. And I could. <laughs> <laughs> um, and nobody knew. So I think that um, more people will buy more headsets and we'll get more joy out of it, hopefully. Yeah, good stuff. And Caroline, what, what about yourself? Where do you see? Uh, obviously, your your funding stuff as well. So you must have some some big hopes for for XR stories over the next sort of six to twelve months. Yeah, I think there's a few things. Um, Five G is a big one because that means multiplayer um, is going to be really possible. Maybe things to do with volumetric. So sports events have done really well at like coming into the home but the whole arts culture sector is really struggling right now so they're going to mm. really try and tap up things like volumetric or immersive audio or ai or all that kind of stuff using games thinking to bring that into the home um on the headset stuff yeah obviously the quest is one to watch the ar glasses and all that let's see what happens Facebook are trialing something with their employees, aren't they, about where the cameras are looking. So see where that goes. Um, and then the metaverse is, yeah, like, so all the Fortnite concert stuff and everything, like the Facebook horizons. I think Zoom is, you know, there's like a, a, an in-between bit of Zoom with Unity or something where it becomes more interesting all the way to VR. And I think there's going to be more of an appetite for something mm. in the middle for connection mm. that isn't quite VR, but it isn't quite Zoom. So have you seen yeah. spatial? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, and that's in um, Oculus now directly, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, let's see what happens. I mean, um, six months, I don't know, but 
yeah and also six months of lockdown what's that going to do to people oh, if God. We're... Yeah. <laughs> make well, us um, more creative <laughs> yeah exactly well this is it um thanks everybody there's a there's a massive electrical storm going on outside so i'm hoping that my wi-fi router will will stay working for the next minutes but uh Thanks, everyone. Thanks to uh, all our brilliant speakers today. To Jed, thank you for joining us. Great talk. Uh, to Caroline, Marion, Kate from XR Stories. Uh, Steve Tagger, nice to see you again. End Dreams. And Emma as well. Thanks for joining from Cooperative uh, Innovations. Uh, brilliant stuff. Uh, we're I recording have, I this. Do have one, I do have one other 12-month oh, yes. prediction, Jamie. Yeah, go on then. Leeds United will have won the Premier League. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, yeah, if that happens... You know, that would be amazing and, uh, yeah, make um, everything worthwhile. So, yeah. The world's that's, that's... just crazy enough, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it could just happen. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, our next event, as I, I was just going to say, actually, we, I'm recording this, so if you want to rewatch it, I'm going to put it on YouTube tomorrow so you'll be able to catch up and I'll send out an email to everybody. Uh, our next Game Republic event is on Wednesday, the 14th of October, and we've got Ubisoft uh, joining us for that, which should be cool. Uh, they're going to talk about their indie publishing uh, side of things um so until then thank you all for joining us today uh, really appreciate it um take care of yourselves and um see you all soon cheers